Okay, it's indicating live, so I can see we are now on. Uh, we can now officially start it then. Uh, good day to everyone. Good good afternoon to our Brazilian colleagues, uh, to our colleagues from South America. Good afternoon to uh, Frank Huda, to Professor Frank Huda, our guest here today. He is in uh, Germany right now. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, to uh, continue these web seminars on the subject Hegel and politics, new perspectives. Uh, this is the third of a series of web seminars organized around our philosophy journal, Hegelian Studies, here from Brazil, Revista Eletrônica de Estudos Hegelianos. And more specifically, this is about uh, the two last issues of Hegelian Studies the issues we called Hegel and Politics, New Perspectives, published from 2018 on. Uh, we intend with these web seminars, for those who are attending this for the first time, as said in the other, uh, in the other meetings, uh, we intend to promote and to discuss new and original interpretations of Hegel's political philosophy made by scholars from all over the world and who publish their works also in our journal. And we hope to be able also to offer uh, instruments to think contemporary problems and challenges from a Hegelian perspective. Uh, to, today, we have the great pleasure, as I said, uh, to have with us Professor Frank Huda. We also had the great opportunity to welcome in the prior seminars Professor Lisa Herzog from Groningen University, Professor Nor Norbert Vazek from uh, Paris 8, uh, and we are also very happy to welcome in December 17th, uh, Professor Paulo Arantes from University of Sao Paulo. And it will be at 7.30 p.m. Brazil's time. For further information about this project and the next web seminars, you can check it on the page, uh, on the internet page of the journal, Hegelian Studies. We will provide the link here in the chat. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, a YouTube channel, where you can find the videos of the last seminars we had. Uh, which reminds me uh, also through the chat, uh, our colleague Ricardo will uh, give his email to, to uh, the colleagues who could be interested in having a certificate for this, uh, for this seminar from today. So uh, the ones who uh, are interested or who need the certificate, they can write to the email that Ricardo will provide through the chat. Uh, I would also like to introduce the members of the organizing committee of these web seminars. Uh, they are, uh, we can see them in the uh, on the screen. Uh, I, me myself, I am organizing this, and I'm also co-editor of Hegelian Studies. I'm Poliana Chidri. I'm a postdoc researcher, PNPD Caps at. Unicinos University, and I will ask my colleagues Ricardo Criciúma and Emanuel Nakamura to introduce themselves. Do you want to go, Ricardo? So, okay, uh, just to, to, to say hello to everybody, I wish a very good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Ricardo Criciúma, I'm professor in the Department of University of Rio Grande do Sul. And I am also a part of the editorial committee of the online uh, Regalian Journal. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am a postdoc, I am Emanuel Nakamura, a postdoc student at uh, Unicamp, Universidade de Campinas, and I am also an uh, editor from the uh, um, journal uh, Estudos Hegelianos. Um, and it's nice to see you here, Frank Huda. Yeah, we also would like to mention that uh, there are other colleagues who are organizing this uh, web seminars uh, with us. Professor Fabio Nolasco from the University from Brasilia. He's also a co-editor of Hegelian Studies and Professor Inácio Helfer, my colleague here at Unicinos. Uh, I think it's also important to mention that we have the support of our Hegel's working group, uh, or peer group, GT Hegel from AMPOF, the National Association of Philosophy Research, 
and the support of Hegel's Brazilian society. So I'd like to thank them for backing us up on this project. Uh, that said, before I can introduce uh, Frank Huda and give, give him the floor, I'd like to uh, make a quick explanation about how this seminar is going to work. So first I'll hand over to Professor Huda, uh, who will have up to 45, 50 minutes to uh, make his presentation. And then we will open to the debate, to the questions, to the remarks. Uh, and we we'll also would like to, uh, the attendees to contribute with questions. They can write it down through the chat. Uh, for those who uh, don't have their name in, the, uh, uh, in their profile, we just ask them to, uh, when they write down their questions, to inform their name and if that's the case, also the university to which they belong. Well, I think we can now uh, finally move on to the uh, seminar itself. So today we have the great pleasure to welcome Professor Frank Huda. He is professor at the University of Dundee in Scotland, and he authored a large number of works and articles, so I'll limit myself to name just a few. Uh, he published in 2011 Hegel's Purve, which has also uh, who was also edited in English as Hegel's Rebel. In 2013, he contributed with Remembering the Impossible to the Idea of Communism, edited by Slavoj Žižek. 2015, he published For Bad You, Idealism Without Idealism. 2016, uh, we have, uh, among others, Abolishing Freedom and Slavoj Žižek and Dialectical materi Materialism. Uh, Slavoj Žižek and Dialectical Materialism, uh, this was published he was the editor together with Agon Hamza. 2018, he authored Gegen Freiheit, Comic und Fatalismus, Indifferenz und Wiederholung, Freiheit in der Moderne, and uh, together with Rebecca Comey, The Dash, The Other Side of Absolute Knowing, and together with Zizek and Hamza, he published Reading Mark. Well, we also had the great opportunity to publish an article of Professor Huda in the last issue of Hegel and Politics of Stux Hegelianus, A Populaça ou Fim do Estado Hegeliano, The Rebel or the End of the Hegelian State. So after this opening, this introduction, I'd like once more to thank and to give the floor to Professor Frank Huda. Well, thank you very much for um, this very kind um, introduction, this very kind invitation. I took this occasion um, as an opportunity to return to things that I have um, worked on a long time ago, namely uh, things pertaining to the category and the concept of the rabble in Hegel, but, um, but from a different angle and in slightly different different um, way so that hopefully it will resonate um, with more contemporary issues, but we can see in the discussion if that works or not. So I start. I will not begin today's lecture by directly turning to Hegel. Now you will all be disappointed and I'm sorry about that. But there is reason sometimes even in disappointment. Instead of directly beginning with the thing in itself, Hegel, I mean. I want to begin with a detour, as Hegel so often does in his introductions that do neither introduce the thing, nor are they the thing. This detour will also take me back to things I worked on a while ago, as I said just a moment ago, but from a different and new angle. The detour is a detour not away from, but into, toward Hegel, a detour that seeks to point to an actuality of Hegel, especially for phenomena which he allows us to think and which seem to be highly relevant for us today. I will sketch and characterize these by drawing two half, actually, other thinkers, namely, um, first, the German sociologist Niklas Luhmann, who was officially uh, called a number of times Hegel of sociology, and then the French discourse historian Michel Foucault, and I will also briefly dip our feed head up high into some of Marxist waters. 
So at the beginning, a detour, and even verse two, Duman and Foucault. But both will lead me back to Hegel and allow to highlight aspects of a strange phenomenon, namely of the rabble, in a more contemporary light, I think. If we want to speak about social exclusion, we need to trust our eyes. Then we see the misery that actually exists. This is what Niklas Luhmann claims in one of his late texts. I quote, whoever trusts her eyes can see it and in an impressiveness that has available explanations fail. Unquote. If we do not believe our eyes and do not look with an impartial gaze at the mechanisms of exclusion and the misery they generate, we only see in the misery what we always already have or at least believe to have seen or known. Exclusion is difficult because it's specific and novel. One must trust one's eyes, distrust those who don't do it. And therefore, argues, one can only speak of exclusion by accepting theories that remain blind against exclusion by reducing to something all too well known. He distinguishes or identifies two such visions. First, Hegelian Marxist theories, and second, theories of human rights. First, Luhmann argues one has to get rid of the supposedly, I quote, simple traditional models, unquote, like Marxism, because they commit a twofold mistake. They firstly believe exclusion is always primarily economic, i.e. they assume a primacy of the economic in the last instance to speak with Louis Althusser. Economic structures are thereby taken to be the structural paradigm of all systems of society one part is taken to stand for the whole, but thereby um, they see in exclusion ultimately an essentially economic phenomenon only. Secondly, such Marxism, and this is reductive, right? This is the claim. Secondly, such Marxism, and this is why for Luhmann it is Hegelian in spirit, assumes that the economic class antagonisms could be overcome through the necessary movement of history, which entails for him the translation of the problem of exclusion into what Luhmann calls a logic of time, in which is the, I quote, dialectical development with eventual revolutionary coaching, unquote. Exclusion thereby is turned into a problem that historical development in its dialectical rendering has always already potentially overcome. So exclusion is not a problem. Exclusion is explained away. Hegelian Marxism does not have the impartial gaze that Luhmann uh, uh, recommends, since the assumption of the primacy of economy and of the dialectical historical dissolution of its antagonistic effects contributes to, I quote Luhmann again, a belittlement of the problem, unquote, and not to its adequate theoretical observation. Hegelianized Marxism trivializes the really existing problem of exclusion because its entire outlook relies on the demand of an of what Luhmann calls an inclusion without exclusion, which is nothing but an embodiment of what again Luhmann uh, calls a totalitarian logic. So a totalitarian logic is one which only knows inclusion without exclusion. A totalitarian logic that knows no outside. It cannot think exclusion proper because it always already excluded it. Whatever and whoever appears excluded is actually only historically not yet included. A charge that, for example, in a different fashion, um, 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 the early Giorgio Agamben raised against Hegel's entire dialectical logical framework, that even by including certain things, they're so included that there is no exclusion. I quote Luhmann, within the totalitarian logic of inclusion, Exclusions are noticed as problematic remainders that are categorized such do not question the totalitarian logic. So the logic is not irritated by concrete historical phenomena. But to believe exclusions are such remainders is to believe in progress, and this means to pres presume, I quote Luhmann, more of social, social order than is actually given, unquote. Luhmann's well-known solution to the Hegelian dilemma is to conceive of exclusion under the condition of a functional differentiation of society into subsystems without hegemony of one over the others. 
Hegelianized Marxism in this rendering ignores the order of exclusion and its particular forms. Social classes might have been useful operators, for example, in stratified societies or to describe and think through problems of stratified societies. But under differentiated conditions, such bias leads to, I quote Luhmann, laments without end and without address C. Hegelian Marxism is therefore embarked on a search for addresses, for reproaches, and for point of attack, for change. But it is sometimes simply not a person's fault, but just a result of uh, contingency and social differentiation. What one abstracts from is that under conditions of functional differentiation, exclusions have what Luhmann calls a different structure, and therefore classical concepts like exploitation and oppression become theoretically inept. Since, I quote again, if one looks closer, one does not find anything that is to be exploited or oppressed, unquote. That was Luhmann, right? There's nothing that one can determine uh, as being exploited or oppressed. Hegelian Marxism thereby loses what Luhmann calls its relation to reality. Something almost similar applies for Luhmann to those theories that operate with idealizations, as he calls it, and are also based on the postulate of all inclusion on what he describes as a metaphysics of happiness. And it might be interesting to recall that uh, the French philosopher Alain Badiou recently wrote a book under precisely this, this title. Luhmann summarizes these positions under the label of an ideology of human rights and claims that they see social inclusion assured in advance through creation and nature through the nature of human being, since there's always already a latent kind of universal inclusion into the species at play. Why this is supposed to be the similar position to that of Hegelian Marxism or comparable is that is because exclusion is carried along unlit. This is a Luhmann's formulation. Again, it can only be understood as not yet inclusion. So exclusion is identified with not yet inclusion as obstacle to what is inevitable given or will inevitably be given in the future. Exclusion is again only an empirical, not at all a real or theoretical problem. And so both positions evade thinking exclusion. So Luhmann's argument is that both theoretical positions um, pull some all inclusion into history or into the species out of their conceptual hat and thereby are not able to see the factic facticity and specificity of the exclusion brought about by contemporary societies that are socially differentiated. Hegelian Marxism and human rights ideologies are something like conceptual defense form uh, formations against seeing the world as it is. His point is simple. The conditions of inclusions vary with the grade of social differentiation development of society, let me put it differently. And with full differentiation, there is only, Luhmann now, a principle full inclusion. There's only a principle full inclusion of the population into social systems. So it's not granted, it's not totalitarian, it's right. It's just by, by, by principle it should, should happen. What full differentiation means is that there is no longer any macro, macro social and overarching difference which would organize all social life, but differences are regulated by particular and specific subsystems of society with their particular and specific um, sub-distinctions or sub, um, let's say, um, glasses on through which they see the world. What is then Luhmann talking about when he talks about exclusion? On one side, Luhmann never tires to emphasize that, I quote, one can only speak about inclusion in, a, inclusion in a meaningful way if there is exclusion. The concept of form that structures any kind of social observation for Luhmann has two sides. There is no inclusion without exclusion. And with this, he seems to insist that each inclusion, inclusion as much as it, each exclusion is system specific. That's to say, inclusion exclusion into the system of right into the system um, into the educational system and so forth so if i am excluded from the educational system this means something very different than being excluded from the legal system for example or from the economic system right if i'm excluded from the educational system i don't don't don't, don't get a place in school but it's very different 
um, um, from from uh, being being fundamentally without rights, right? This is Lumen's argument. So against one overarching theory of exclusion, Lumen seeks to posit specific observations of particular exclusory effects that are specified because of the subsystems uh, in which they take place, or in relation to uh, uh, which they take place. But because Lumen was not a moron, that is to say because he remained faithful to his own claim that one must rigidly rigidly, sorry, trust one's eyes, he clearly saw that even though there is no overarching and unified regulatory process of exclusion, there nevertheless emerge, now Lumen, quasi-automatically additional and supplementary exclusory mechanisms when there is, I quote, an expulsion from one functional system. So I lose my my integration into the the my, my participation my inclusion into let's say the economic system and that might have an impact on my inclusion into the educational system and so forth so Luhmann perceives that this creates mutually increased cumulative exclusion effects which is why and now surprisingly Luhmann ends up stating that the distinction inclusion exclusion i quote takes over the function of a primary differentiation of the social system because it overcodes, unquote, society. He even compares it, um, he says, semantically, it's similar to the distinction between self and, and hetero reference that concerns all subsystems of society. So he's basically saying, right, there is no one differentiation, one, one protocol of differentiation by means of which we could uh, understand the, the inclusion or exclusion into all subsystems. But because there is this cumulative effect, there seems to be at the end result, as the end result, Precisely that which should not exist. Luhmann comes to this conclusion after a trip to Brazil and after visiting favelas. From then on, he believes that the effects of cumulative exclusion lead to the peculiar result that even though functional differentiation made impossible one leading type of differentiation for the entire society, one must nonetheless believe that the distinction between inclusion and exclusion is I quote, the lead difference, it's my tr mediocre translation of the light difference, the lead difference of the next century, unquote. It seems what now appears as result and product of the differentiation processes is what is the, what, what Luhmann calls the sociality of the social, unquote, or what he also describes as a meta difference which mediatizes the codes of the functional systems, a meta difference on which hinges the sociality of the social. The strange thing that seems to be happening is that even though inclusion and exclusion just seem to be particular, uh, to, to be one particular difference or one particular mechanism that should be system specific, like legal, illegal for the legal system, payment and non-payment for the economic system, it starts to look as if inclusion and exclusion becomes a kind of concrete, a particular embodiment of something universal. This is what the concept of the meta difference uh, seems to address. Even though one only sees this through observing the cumulative effects of being excluded from one of the partial system, social systems that then um, 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 uh, worsens afterwards. Luhmann believed to have been able to observe cumulative exclusion effects while he was in Brazil. And this is what in, in this kind of, let's say, autobiographical background, the, the encounter with the favelas or the favela experience stand for. But what does remain at the end of the cumulative uh, process of exclusions, of the adding up of different types of exclusions from, from particular subsystems? Luhmann answers, what remains are, I quote, bodies, or in an almost Agambanian vein, pure life. Both uh, quotes from Luhmann, bodies, pure life. But what is pure life other than a life purified of all relevant social determinations and political determinations and legal determinations, and thus in Lumen's parlance of all relevant semantics and social communications? Now at the peak of a functionally sub-differentiated society, where there is no overarching society uh, dif difference anymore, appears something that reminds us, I quote Lumen, 
of a very archaic order, unquote. What Luhmann is saying is that in the middle of a society that is functionally differentiated into specific subsystems, we now encounter something that seems surprisingly not functionally differentiated, but appears as container of all particular exclusions of all excluded life. We encounter pure life. Luhmann claims that what, that what one sees in the realm of culminating um, cumulative uh, culminating exclusion is a kind of, I quote, warning example, unquote, since therein appears no recognizable order, a kind of absence of organized sociality proper, right? The sociality of the social is excluded from the realm of exclusion. Because exclusion is an exclusion from the sociality of the social. But the realm of inclusion thereby commences to form to force one overarching difference onto the totality of society, social, unsocial, for example, namely that of being included in one or more social system systems or falling outside of pretty much all of them, even though one starts with one particular exclusion. Right? You lose your job, then you have educational problems, then this means something for the legal system and so forth. Now, it would be a longer discussion if this diagnosis does allow for traditional Marxism to return to the scene, but I would like here to end the first detour and bring this problem specific to more than modern, namely, I mean, in Lumen's understanding, namely sub-differentiated societies, back to what Hegel said about the nature of civil society and its relation to a specific form of exclusion occurring within its, its realm. I want to suggest that what Luhmann discovers at the peak of cumulative exclusion, a kind of absolute exclusion, if you wish, is something that Hegel long before, and maybe even more systematically, ad identified as a feature of what he called rabble, or more specifically of what I call the poor rabble. Um, now the second part. In May 1833, Eight years after Hegel's death and on the occasion of the great he uh, Hegel oeuvre edition, Edward Gans in what Manfred Riedel called a prophetic preface, remarked that the philosophy of right will stand and fall with the rest of Hegel's system. And I would like to claim it is, among other things, a concept that Hegel develops in his philosophy of objective spirit that is of an even increased significance today. In it, as I indicated in the in the, the reading um, that was potential preparation for today and also in my remarks earlier. Um, and as you all know from reading Hegel, um, the latter name Hegel remarks that poverty is something that torments modern societies in a specific way. So very different from medieval societies, for example. For to use this previous terminology, Luhmann's terminology, why it tor torments modern societies is because it produces exclusion. Poverty is a state in which all the advantages of civil societies are lost, but all the needs created by it, or the desires created by it, or the, the entire wish list, if you wish, remain. Now, poverty is not a contingent phenomenon, but as Hegel um, uh, shows, a necessary result of the dynamic that is constitutive of civil society. So the realization of the external concatenation of particular individual determinations of freedom, so in bringing together externally different and thus inner self-determinations of particular free wills, you choose what you want to do, I choose what I want to do, and we have a huge bunch of other people who do that too, and we are forced to interact, and this generates a, 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 a larger rational con uh, concatenation, that is civil society. In doing that, the, this results in bringing a number of individuals in a situation where they cannot realize the freedom in a way, uh, in the same way as others can. And this is, this is the, the contradiction of, of civil society. This is a result of civil society. So a sp particular and specific realization of collective individualized freedoms leads to the fact that this becomes an exclusive form in which freedom is realized. Some people are excluded from it. These people are the poor. This happens because when the poor, who is structurally excluded from the possibility of 
acquiring her subsistence, say because of techno technological innovation that 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 um, disqualifies her previous qualification or puts her out of the job, or because a branch disappears or because uh, um, something similar. Um, she is thereby, the poor is thereby excluded from realizing her freedom and excluded from participating in what Hegel, and I'm leaving out that concept, but I wanted to indicate that, um, calls the minimal representational units um, of civil society, namely an estate, where people of similar professions gather together. And this means, I quote uh, Mark Neocleus here, not being a member of an estate means that a person is nothing and nobody. Why that is seems clear, namely civil society is the mediating space within which the ethicality of the state begins to be generated, right? We get a better, a more, 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 uh, more adequate sense um, that our own realization of freedom hinges on the realization of the freedom of others. But if that generates excluding mechanisms, the people who are excluded from realizing their freedoms and from participating in that, that collective form of realizing um, 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 individual freedoms, um, they, they don't count anymore. This is what I'm trying to say. If one falls out of this mediating mechanism, one falls out of the shared space in which sociality is constituted, the sociality of the social and reproduced, um, and one is excluded from further unfolding of social relations. The poor or impoverished thereby come close to what Jacques Rancière called the part des sans part, the part of those who do not participate, the part without a part. And it's also easy to detect that Hegel sees the effects of cumulative exclusory processes and effect in civil society. For example, when he notes the following, it's a longer quote, I'm going to read it slowly because I think it's quite quite um, um, breathtakingly impressive. So Hegel notes about, quote, the possibility that individuals sink into poverty, that no human being can live from the immediate fruits of nature. They are commanded by civil society. Poverty thus happens because the immediate means are no longer. Furthermore, poverty also happens because the poor cannot acquire any skills. Poor children do not have the means to acquire skills or industrial branches move. They do not have the skills to work in another industrial branch and cannot learn anything because of poverty. They even lose judicature since it produces costs that the poor cannot find, even if she can, the little bit what she obtains through the legal process cannot counterbalance the cost. Poverty exacerbates the means to maintain or generate health. Even the consolation of religion is impeded for them if they do not own a dominical dress. The gospel is only preached to the educated. The clergy does not go into the huts of the poor. That was all Hegel, right? I mean, so he described how poverty has an impact on education, has an impact on the participation in religious practice, has an impact on acquiring um, um, new skills, on, adapt on, on moving somewhere else, um, on uh, participation in the legal sphere. Hegel is quite clear. There is cumulative exclusion, but it begins from and with poverty. Does this mean a primacy of the economy? No. It rather means that we're talking about specific realizations of freedom that certainly and importantly become manifest in terms of choosing a profession and other kinds of self-determining determining, um, features. And all that is the development of the concept of right, right? I mean, this is important to bear in mind. And in civil society, the form in which freedom can at all be realized is through individual participation in the general economy, <clears throat> something which, with, uh, which even Luhmann seems to agree, as it does not seem to be an accident <clears throat> for him that exclusion often starts with a fall into unemployment. So I'm trying to say this is not simply a reductive account, right? I mean, this in this sense, this is not a, a primacy of the economy. Even though these kind of exclusory mechanisms are clearly um, effectuated and generated within the sphere of civil of civil society, which is short and um, shorthand for the economy. <clears throat> Excuse me.
But the real problem, as you may already know, is not poverty, but the rebel. The poor rebel is the poor having gone infamous. It is the lowest form of subsistence, as Hegel says, those who are maximally day laborers or beggars. But what constitutes the poor rebel is that the rebel forms a kind of latent consciousness of the universality of the processes of cumulative exclusion, which become manifest in himself. So he's excluded from, from a series of what, what um, Luhmann would have or described as subsystems. And he understands that this is not accident or his or her own fault. Um, but that there, this that in him manifests something symptomatically which has a universal value. And and how does uh, the rebel realize that? Because everyone can lose um, um, his or her job and therefore fall into poverty, and everyone, every poor, can form a certain attitude and consciousness toward a society that demands from everyone to work and earn one's own subsistence, but which, in the very same breath, makes it impossible to realize this, realize this demand for everyone. This contradiction between the universality of its demand and the nece necessary particularity in which it can be realized is what the uh, rabble identifies and expresses and what thereby it identifies as a wrong, dishonest, and illegitimate self-subverting form of universality. This leads the rabble to feel a general indignation against those with the job, with money, against society and the government, against the entire system of law. The poor rebel identifies its own situation as a wrong and as unjust and identifies a society which cannot agree with his or her judgment and only sees bad luck in it as particularly unjust. Right? So someone who can't see that a society who demands from you to work or to earn your own subsistence, but creates generates an impossibility to 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 act accordingly um if that cannot be identified in terms of an injustice this is the ultimate injustice thereby the poor rebel is the disenfranchised poor a member of society that loses its place in society and with it its political right since without property and means to ensure its own subsistence the poor rebel is no longer an integrated part of society and if there is a second generation of the poor, for example, or poor children, as Hegel says in the quote, this indicates a lack of education and formation so that the rebel distancing itself from the society which generated it does also no longer participate in the estates and thereby loses the possibility of, being, of, of having any kind of representation. Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, um, therefore, um, I think when he was still at the, at the Collège, uh, Collège de France, um, at one point had the idea, and I think that was his reaction to a kind of similar problem, that one would need something like an international of the unemployed. If representation presupposes participation, those who are no part and do not participate lose representation. This is the short version of the argument. And Hegel will characterize the, the poor rebel as marked by a series of, of, of losses that I'm, that I'm not uh, reconstructing here. But but that the rubble is an indication of maximal exclusion, of loss of inclusion, or of loss of the sociality of the social. In this sense, I mean, in, that, that is the sense, I think, that um, um, one should uh, bear in mind if one reads Hegel's claim that, I quote, if a human being makes itself lawless and unbinds itself also from the duties, this is the rubble. If a human being makes itself lawless and unbinds itself also from the duties, this is the rabble. Hegel clearly describes the, uh, the rabble in terms of social, political, and bindung, unbinding, which means it, the rabble, cuts off the social bond, it disengages and absorbs it, but thereby it also releases itself from it. The poor rabble in the sense is Hegel's name for a radical type of exclusion, which is both objectively generated, this is right, I mean, the, 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 the poor um, 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 are involuntarily poor, it's a dynamic of civil society, but it's also subjectively mediated because the move from, from being poor to uh, forming the indignation by which one delegitimizes the existing society because it demands something and cannot uh, provide the preconditions for, um, to fulfill what it demands, um, is um, uh, is a let's say subjectivization of that that structural contradictions contradiction sorry 
And this points to the fact that if everyone could end up poor and everyone could subjectivize this kind of contradiction that it manifests in poverty, any potentially anyone, this is the universal implication or the universal dimension of this position, um, could be um, could become at least rabble. But to speak for a second, like Lenin, there is in Hegel rabble and there is the rabble. Hegel indicates that when he, um, in a later lecture uh, on the philosophy of right, indicates that there is also the rich rabble. I don't want to give you a specification of the entirety of the argument about the rich rabble, but I want to single out one, 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 one specific feature. Um, and it's kind of an experiment, and I'm, I'm interested to see if that works out. And um, um, to do this, I'm going to start my second detour. Third part, Foucault, Hegel. In a slightly artificial way, I'd like to jump to a strange diagnosis which can be found in Michel Foucault's work. While investigating the functioning of psychiatric power and the workings of its, what Joseph Foucault called its sovereignty effects, Foucault mentions a specific type of sovereign conduct, I quote, one of the essential processes of arbitrary sovereignty that he seeks already at work in the, in the Roman Empire. So nothing Hegel was particularly fond of, but so arbitrary sovereignty. This process is what he addresses as grotesque sovereignty. So what is grotesque sovereignty? It does neither represent a failure or mishap of the sovereign function, nor its monstrous or abnormal excrescence. This is to say, it's not an external accident that would rather distract or hinder sovereignty from the outside, nor does sovereignty degenerate in it. Rather, grotesque sovereignty, I quote, is one of the cogs that are inherent an inherent part of the mechanism of power, unquote. It is an essential operational power form. All sovereigns can go commando and grotesque all the time, anywhere. <clears throat> but what are the conditions for the grotesque to come out of the closet? This question addresses what Foucault calls the problem of the infamy of sovereignty. And I hope you see the link between the, the, the formation of the rabble attitude, which is an infamous attitude, right? This is why um, Hegel constantly says um, they don't have any kind of honor left and the infamy of the sovereignty. So the problem of the infamy of sovereignty, a problem that Foucault sees to, sees to occupy its place in literature from Shakespeare through Balzac, Dostoevsky, Kurglin to Kafka. Power does not only produce grotesque sovereignty effects, the latter manifested by even generating its own genre of literature. What this literature depicts is how, I quote Foucault, a discourse or an individual can have effects of power that their intrinsic qualities should disqualify them from having. A discourse or an individual can have effects of power that the intrinsic qualities should disqualify them from having." Unquote. It shows how someone can produce sovereignty power effects even if he or she, because of the ways in which she behaves, thinks or talks, appears fully disqualified from having any power. Power can self-disqualify itself without losing power. The grotesque sovereign is the sovereign who is not simply mistake, making a mistake, is not he or she who is incapable in a position of power, but the clown or buffoon, as Foucault says, the visibly zany, the transparently shady, and the idiotic criminal, he or she who on average appears in advance to be disqualified to ever hold any position of power to the court. The grotesque thus describes the mode of sovereign conduct wherein we witness, I quote, an almost theatrical disqualification of the origin of power, unquote, in the very exercise of power. There is a form of power that constitutively disqualifies itself by disqualifying its own constitution. The grotesque sovereign is not the clown that entertains the king. It is the king that is the entertaining clown. Power can thus operate by delegitimizing the representative of its own operation. The de-justification embodied and practiced by the grotesque sovereign does rather pertain to the very idea that sovereign power would fundamentally rely on qualifications 
competence, and therefore knowledge and capacity. The grotesque sovereign bursts all illusions that power and qualification or justification are intrinsically connected and codependent. It is like the Hegelian monarch yet in the state which gives him or her more rights than Hegel would have ever assigned to him. The grotesque sovereign is not the genius in well-functioning disguise, but the grotesque sovereign is what he or she is, a moron, a buffoon, a nonetheless sovereign. This is what is grotesque. This is precisely what is grotesque. Grotesque sovereignty can therefore, in its undisguised nakedness, appear to unmask the way sovereignty and power functions by making explicit what was or universally known to be implicit all along. Yet because grotesque sovereignty is at the same time an operational form of power, its nakedness can function as the ultimate disguise of power. A disguise non-exposing itself through revelation and transparency, the grotesque sovereign is the naked emperor who admits that she is naked. She uses, that's a quote by Peter Sloterdijk, disguise that does not conceal anything, unquote. Seneca reason operates by knowing something to be the case and by not acting on the basis of that very knowledge. The grotesque sovereign mobilizes the powers of cynical reason and does not practically bracket this or that concrete knowledge, that she is a gangster, a liar, etc., but knowledge about the corruptibility of sovereign power as such. If the ordinary critique of power relies on an act of unmasking some specific dishonesty or corruption, of removing its appearance of legitimacy, the grotesque sovereign discourse assimilates the critical gesture and integrates it into its own act of self-disqualification as empowerment, as technique of empowerment. Its divestment is its ultimate investment, the divestiture its investiture, the denudation its costume. This is criticism reified, self-criticism included. This is why there is more and not more to grotesque sovereignty than meets the naked eye. Everyone knows it and knows that it is what it appears to be. It works similar to the liar who admits that he is lying, the liar lying honestly. Her nudity is and is not just another costume. What her nudity ultimately disguises is not something about the functioning of grotesque sovereignty, but about the very power that she incorporates. Foucault hints at this by remarking that the grotesque sovereign makes apparent the gap between power and its representation. Power at times operates better and more efficient in a grotesque way. There are mat material historical conditions that enable such grotesque functioning. These are fulfilled. And now I think this is um, this is crucial for 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 my my let's say experimental argument. These material material historical conditions are fulfilled when there is what um, 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 Thomas Dam once called in, in in commenting on Foucault a disqualification of the system itself. If grotesque sovereignty is an internal element to the functioning of power, it comes to the fore when there is a problem with a given regime of power. Foucault, quite different from his usual methodological demeanor, identif identifies the grotesque as an almost transhistorical concept or transhistorical conceptual feature of the operation of power in times of emergency. Power can always retort in grotesque ways. If a political or economic system, this is what I'm trying to say, is inherently unsustainable and everyone knows it, if there is, for example, a poor rabble massively forming, the grotesque sovereign appears because it does something with and to the knowledge of a system's unsustainability. They embody the systematic disqualification in such a way that it is separated from the system within the system. This does something to everyone's knowledge of the system's imminent crisis. Grotesque sovereigns are what allows for a system to continue to function. I quote um, Alenka Tsupancic, not in spite of our disillusionment, but precisely because of it. Grotesque sovereigns embody the political crisis that generated them so that they take it away from the system and on themselves, a crisis that is not historically limited to the Roman Empire, but that from a certain moment on also emerges, um, that's now Foucault, uh, sorry, Kujin Karatani in the midst of the modern nation state.
so in the midst of the modern nation state, grotesque sovereigns appear because there is an insight into the unsustainability of the system um, and the attempts to divert the attention from it. Grotesque sovereigns are expressions of the dysfunctionality of the system. This is a point recently made by, by Alain Badiou in his book on, on Trump. Grotesque sovereigns are living invisibilizations of a systematic crisis in the form of its most visible expression. This is why one can easily turn them into an object of critique and ridicule, which at the same time does not affect, affect the system at all. Part of the grotesque sovereign's function is therefore to nurture the belief that if someone else ruled, there would be no crisis of the system. By objectively embodying and individualizing the structural non-functionality of the system, they silently work for its reproduction and justification by, even if often and certainly in an unwilling manner, taking the whole of its inconsistency and contradiction onto themselves. Grotesque sovereigns are thus transubstantiations of systematic dysfunctions, incoherent, incoherence uh, or contradiction, idiotic messiahs of a tumbling world. They bring together the highest sovereignty and the lowest carnality, vulgarity, etc., into a union of opposites. It means telling the truth where one should lie, lying otherwise. In this sense, they sublate, sublate the systematic problem by not sublating it at the same time, but by exposing and hiding it at the very same time. The essentially reproductive quality is felt in the repeated call to a return to normality uttered by their opposites, a call which almost immediately emerges with them. They allow to internally isolate the apparent inconsistency of a system as if it were external to it. Grotesque sovereignty is a way of treating contradictions in the midst of the system by not treating, but by displacing them. It brings together solving and not solving the crisis, bringing together even logically disparate elements in what ultimately makes the grotesque into the grotesque. With it, we reach a higher logical level the inconsistency becomes manifest, but in an idiotic, zany, individual form, and we thus regress at the same time. The grotesque sovereign is, in other words, a symptom, or as Karl Marx once said, a symptom of decay. Part four, Foucault, Hegel. Why am I telling you about the grotesque sovereigns, you may wonder? Well, one answer can be given, I think, um, which does not immediately take us back to Hegel, but, um, to Marx and then through him to Hegel ultimately. Since Marx himself in the aftermath, uh, aftermath uh, of the failed workers' revolution in France and pretty much everywhere in Europe in 1848 offers in his 18th Brumaire a historically informed but systematic account of the constitution of a grotesque sovereign, namely of Napoleon III, whom he calls, I quote, the grotesque chief of the society of the 10th December or the grotesque ventriloquist in the theories, and who is the grotesque union of the greatness of Napoleon I and the pettiness of himself the third that undermines it. Marx's aim is, I quote Marx, to demonstrate how the class struggle in France created circumstances and relationships that made it possible for a grotesque mediocrity to play a hero's part, unquote. So a grotesque sovereign appears in the midst of Europe, not even 20 years after Hegel's death, and is depicted in a text which begins with one of the most famous Hegel references in the entire oeuvre of Marx. You know which one I mean, the one about repetition, tragedy, and farce. Now, it seems that not only is Napoleon III a farcical repetition of what appeared the first time as tragic world spirit on a horseback, but, and this is crucial, Marx in this detailed and dialectically twisted depiction of how Napoleon III came to power, and for that even used um, and, and, and for that, even use the, the widely implemented universal suffrage, um, formulates an interesting account of one of the key players, so to speak, of one of the key actors in this political theater of the coup d'etat that has um, been worrying entire traditions of Marxist readers, as it seems to ruin any neat dialectical schema, or worse, as some argued, even complicate the smooth functioning, if it was ever smooth of the concept um, of his concept of class so precisely what 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 Luhmann, Luhmann assumed and this let's say weird key player which complicates things is what Marx calls the lumpen proletariat 
So I'm saying the lumpen proletariat plays a key role in the institution, um, in the implementation, in the in the in the coming to power of um, of um, the grotesque sovereign that is Napoleon the Third. One line of critique of Marx that the Lumpen proletariat is based is that uh, the Lumpen proletariat. So a line of critique of of, of Marx's position, right, um, um, is that the Lumpen proletariat, Lumpen proletariat. I can't unfortunately pronounce that word. That the Lumpen proletariat is basically composed of the excluded members of all classes and hence represents the excluded even from the proletariat. That is to say, the excluded of the excluded. Right. I mean that has been. Been a criticism. So there are people that are even more excluded um, than 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 um, the um, than uh, the 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 proletariat. Okay. And Marx was often, as was Engels, harsh uh, harshly criticized for attacking the lumpen proletariat fiercely in the Manifesto, uh, which I leave aside here, but also directly in the Brumaire. In the later, so in the Brumaire, Marx writes, and I quote now, that the lumpen proletariat of Paris has been organized into secret sections, each section being led by Bonapartist agents. Alongside decayed ruse, with dubious means of subsistence and of dubious origin, alongside ruined and adventurous offshoots of the bourgeoisie were vagabonds, discharged soldiers, discharged jailbirds, escaped galley slaves, rogues, mountebacks, lazzaroni, pickpockets, tricksters, gamblers, muscaro, brothel keepers, porters, literati, organ grinders, rack pickers, knife grinders, tinkers, beggars, in short, the whole indefinite disintegrated mass thrown hither and thither, which the French term la bohème, from this kindred element Bonaparte formed the core of the society of the tent. And he calls Bonaparte, so Marx calls Bonaparte, the chief of the lumpen proletariat, who he alone rediscovers in mass form the interests which he personally pursues, who recognize in this scum, awful refuse of all classes, the only class upon which he can base himself unconditionally. So there is a unconditional link between the 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 um, the um, um, grotesque sovereign and the lumpen proletariat. So Bonaparte, the grotesque sovereign, is a lump that therefore can present represent the disintegrated masses. He's the lump that does not disguise what he is. But it's precisely here that Hegel can help to understand that what Marx describes as lumpen proletariat is precisely not identical. And I think that is that is what I would like to discuss with you, is not identical to the poor rebel, even though some members of the poor maybe or may become a part of the lumpen proletariat, and even though the Lazzaroni in Naples is what Hegel mentions uh, as example um, in the, for example, I think it's Edward Gums actually in the in the comments um, of the of the philosophy of rights, um, the paragraphs where he speaks about the rebel, but the lumpen proletariat. Lumpen proletariat rather corresponds to the second type of rabble, the one that one can find depicted in Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of right, so not in the published form of the outlines. Name the rich rabble. So what and who is the rich rabble? And I'm close to ending. The rabble in general lacks, I quote Hegel, the honor to secure subsistence, by its own labor, and yet at the same time claims the right to receive subsistence." Unquote. Now to claim such a right can take two different forms. The indignant one of the poor rebel, so the poor rebel basically feels indignation because he wants to work, it wants to work, the rebel, but, but uh, uh, civil society structurally makes that impossible, and thereby he sees civil society and its whole system of right as being delegitimized, and thereby he believes he has, it has, a, the poor rebel has a right to receive subsistence even without work. But there is a second form, and the second form is not indignation about the state of the world, but 
one in which um, reigns, I quote, laziness and extravagance, Verschwendung, unquote. And at the basis of this is ultimately, I quote again, corruptedness or depravity, corruptedness or depravity, which in German is Verdorbenheit. Um, And it's it's kind of important even because the the Fadorben is a is a is rotten. I mean, this is basically what it means: is rotten, rotten elements. Right? So, uh, um, because an, an old fruit is Fadorben. Um, okay, and this is what manifests in the potentiality in the potentially rich rebel. This Fadorbenheit, this corruptedness, this rottenness. But how is the rich rebel potentially generated? The answer to this question, which I will only quickly sketch to end the present um, um, lecture, is what will hopefully allow to, in, to see in what precise sense only the potentially rich rebel is identifiable with what Marx, Marx talk, talks about in the, in the lumpen proletariat, and which is actually mobilized by all these grotesque sovereigns um, that, that, that Foucault believes uh, emerge when there is a system crisis. Okay, if the poor rebel is formed through the necessary production of poverty, even though it needs a supplement, namely the indignation, the rich rebel does not begin on a necessary and hence latently universal ground. Rather, it grounds lie in those people who act, I quote Hegel, in isolation and reduce their business to mere self-seeking. Unquote. It is this reduction that delineates the fundamental condition of possibility of the rich rebel. The rich rebel is always first and foremost an isolated, a self-determined and self-isolating um, uh, private person. It begins with someone arbitrarily and vol voluntarily putting self-seeking interests before a mediation of interest. There is the poor rebel emerging from a necessity of poverty involuntarily, but there is also the potentially rich rebel who emerges from an arbitrary choice, a choice that in Kantian terms could even be characterized as evil since it is clearly pathological in Kant's sense of the term, namely a pathological motive, self-seeking um, interest is chosen instead of something universalizable. So, so the, 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 the rich, potentially rich rebel um, um, the, the condition of possibility of the potentially rich rebel form the moment where um, one's own self-seeking interests are put um, or, or are pitted against um, um, universal, universalizability. For we are here talking of a private person who is who reduces itself to the egoistic, egoistic and egotistic side of business, i.e. to the pure self-seeking accumulation of capital arbitrarily decided in favor of the contingency of the market. But this shows that this is a constant option under the given conditions of a civil society. Right? This, I mean, that this is at all possible shows that this is another way of addressing a problem that is um, 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 pertinent. Um, and structurally inscribed into um, civil, the very concept of civil society. If the poor is involuntarily in this situation, the, uh, the potentially rich rebel relies on a voluntary decision of a single private person um, that is constitutive for it. The self-particularization, uh, self-particularizing decision is both made possible and maybe even invited by civil society and yet generated by an individual which seeks to subsist without work. This decision is constitutive of the existence of what Hegel calls in a, in a uh, lecture from 18, 19, 20, the gambler, Spieler. An individual becomes a gambler by deciding to depend and ground his or her existence and subsistence purely on the contingencies of civil society. The whole economic dynamics becomes a gigantic roulette wheel and gambling table. The gambler is even twice governed by arbitrariness. He becomes a gambler through his own arbitrary choice and remains in consequence always subordinated to the same contingency of the game, right? Let's say if, if he, 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 he gains um, money from the stock market or, I don't know, from a grotesque sovereign who puts uh, him in a lucrative position. This is why gamblers just live from moment to moment. They are the real del... The, the real they, well, not laborers, but they non-laborers. 
The gambler puts, due to his particular opinion, the contingent as such in the place of the universe. For him or her, security exists, now Hegel, only for today, unquote. And he or she is thus also in a strange state of lack. This is why Hegel writes that the gambler, if she or he wins, has made, I quote, an acquisition without labor, a contingent winning, so that he produces, quote again, an external, mindless, and immoral, gesinnungslos relationship. So, external, mindless, and immoral relationship. It's self-exclusion, or it's self-exclusion from anything that is common and collective. If he wins subsistence on the gambling table that is civil society, the gambler turns rich and shameless into a rich and shameless travel. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here, but the gambler before winning, and this is what I'm trying to say, always looking for subsistence without work, is precisely what, what I think Mark, Marx will classify later as a lumpen proletariat. So the, the people who are on the verge or are hoping to become the rich rebel. Why Hegel can here help, maybe in addition or maybe even more than Marx, is because he allows to conceive of the very constitution of the genesis of the lumpen proletariat of the lumpen bourgeoisie, as one might also want to say, of those elements of society who are self-seeking and gamble, because in some sense, the current civil society allows and maybe even desperately demands it from them. Hegel might be more actual than Marx today in a time when we are surrounded by grotesque sovereigns everywhere, and we seek to understand how precisely one can understand and maybe fight what appears to, their, to be their popular support. The gambling want to be rich rabble, might therefore gain an unprecedented actuality. Hegel may help when the revolutionary pro, uh, proletariat, or what was seen uh, um, as that by Marx, regressed or declined into the state of the potentially poor rebel. And on the other hand side, we have lumpen everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Ruda. Thank you very much for the, the excellent exposition and for joining us here today. We're very pleased to have you here. Uh, your work is very inspiring, very stimulating, and I'm sure many of us here follow you since uh, following your work since the publication of Hegel's Rebel in 2011. And uh, so we are very excited to have the chance to listen to your thesis, to have listen to your thesis and to have the opportunity to discuss this with you. Uh, I'd like to start with a question and then I will hand over to my colleagues, Ricardo, Manu, and to the colleagues who are sending the questions through the chat. So the ones who are interested in asking a question, you can write it down through uh, our chat here in StreamYard. So my question uh, is, uh, also more direction to uh, your work, Hegel's Rebel, and also to the uh, article you, you wrote for us uh, last year. Uh, and um, because I think one of the most important things uh, in your positions is uh, the fact that you stress that for Hegel, the rebel and the poor are not the same. So uh, the poor will not necessarily become part of the rebel, and also there is a rich rebel. And now Luxus Rebel, uh, the gambler, uh, and uh, what you affirm in your exposition should be the lumpen proletariat. So uh, I think uh, that the problem is much more, and you show that, and you stress that, that the modern, uh, the modern state and uh, the modern society claim to be organized under a principle uh, that is universal, universal rational principle, the principle uh, of work and freedom uh, to everyone. Uh, and uh, the contradiction or the problem uh, which Hegel would point to is uh, that the existence of the rebel show us uh, very much that the right uh, to work as something universal is put into question. So uh, the right to work or the lack uh, of this right to the rebel would be a central fact. And uh, the fact that there are people who are not integrated in these working groups, these working states, these standard corporations, uh, because the poor rebel cannot work uh, and is outraged against society because the right to work is denied to them. 
uh, and then there is the luxus poverty rich uh, poverty rich rebel who uh, don't want to work so uh, uh, the, the gambler uh, they don't want to work or they want to get their subsistence from others other people's uh, other people work so um, uh, I think the problem of work unemployment is stressed also in your paper from last year uh, and for me uh, it just um, I was uh, for me, it was interesting to read, for example, when you say that Frederick Jameson, uh, he, sh he showed that Marx argue also that the problem in capitalism is uh, unemployment. So it's, it, this, this idea is stressed that unemployment seems to be a, a, a essential, a fundamental uh, problem, uh, which it seems to me it could lead to conclusions. And that's my problem. That's my question. Uh, conclusions such as uh, as if the solution would be would be for us to guarantee uh, the right to work to everyone or I think the danger is to think that solution would be that we should stand up for the right to work for everybody but I think this is not uh, in my opinion this is not the fundamental problem we have in capitalism and I think Marx have shown us that uh, the fact that we have unemployment or poverty is a kind of side effect of a very specific working relation we have in capitalism. And the more essential problem is the contradiction between work in a very specific work, wage labor, loan arbeit, and capital. So that even the ones who work, who, uh, who, who can work, who have the right to work, uh, who have a living uh, and subsistence, they also are uh, they are still being alienated from a great part of the wealth they produce so even the ones who are not poor not unemployed they are still trapped in this working relation which feed them these more fundamental contradictions uh, so i think this problem is the problem is not work or not to work but the question is which kind of work we're talking about and uh, i think that that's the uh, maybe the uh, the real problem i think if if we reduce the demand of Hegel or the demand of the rebel to stand up for the right uh, to work we are still not putting into question the fundamental contradictions of capitalism society and uh, yeah i i i'd love to to hear what what you you think about this. um well thank thank you for this uh, that was very rich. Um, le let me let me say maybe two or three things. On the one hand side, there is um, well, there is the claim that that you mentioned that that Jameson articulated, namely that in some essential sense, um, capitalism in in Marx's depiction relies on the production of unemployment. So unemployment is not a mistake, right? Uh, it's not something simply going astray or going wrong, but there, but there, it is part of the reproduction of an econ economic system of capitalism. So the production of people who are, in some sense, deprived of um, of um, realizing if that is still what we're doing uh, in what 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 has also been described by, by Marx as wage slavery right I mean loan sklaverei um, which is I think important important to notice that 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 um, it is for Marx a different form of unfreedom right I mean this is this is absolutely crucial so we're not realizing so so the the, the specific bourgeois interpretation um, and the entire system of rights in in, in Marx's take on this um, does not just offer us one particular realization of freedom and there are other ones, but it is a form of talking about freedom where we're actually forced to be endorsing and participating in a practice of unfreedom, unwillingly, right? I mean, this this is why he talks about wage slavery. I think this is crucial. And the whole and entire economy of wage slavery relies on the production of people who, I think that is, um, that, that is the, 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 the catch in some sense of the, of the rebel unemployment link who are not even exploited, right? I mean, that is the ridiculous, ridiculous thing that Hegel was, um, even though one, one immediately can think 
well, yes, of course, he's talking about a a, a, a pre-modern capitalist kind of economy, right? I mean, it's still uh, grouped and organized in the states, and depending on on what you make of the corporations and whatsoever, it 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 seems a bit outdated and not not let's say not as um, not as um, 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 superbly uh, and detailed developed. Um, I mean, it owes a lot to Adam Smith and so forth, but but it's not not as rich and as detailed and as um, 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 still up to date in in many or many would say that as um, as Marx's account is. But but Hegel was very, I think, very perspicacious that the entire economy and rely. Uh, and that is what he what he describes as civil society relies on dealing, on let me put it differently, on not solving the contradiction that is poverty, right? I mean that that is a whole 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 catch of Hegel's argument. But Hegel basically says, well, it's quite plainly clear there is no way in which civil society could not produce poverty, and at the same time, and that's just the uh, let's say the, the 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 other side of poverty, um, and 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 amassment of wealth. Right. And these two um, 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 these two are manifestations of a of a structural contradictions. Now, what Hegel describes, I think, in the philosophy of right, and this is an insight which is, I think, absolutely crucial, is not only that the that there is an entire economy relying on the production of these types of contradictions, but that the way in which, let's say, the market left to itself. To speak like a liberal for a moment, right? Would deal with that is endlessly postpone dealing with the contradictions, right? I mean, and this is what what one can learn from 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 Marx too. I mean, capital in it. I mean, capitalism does never solve problem. It displaces them. It right. I mean, it 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 postpones dealing with them. That that's what it does. Um, I mean, this is in in some sense the whole crisis theory, if there is any, relies on this. So the I think the interesting the interesting thing that you bring to the fore is. Not simply that we should all demand a universal right for work, and then um, if we would be able to implement that, that we would actually overcome the 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 contradiction that manifests as, let's say, poverty and luxury. That uh, right, uh, in some sense, um, or poverty and wealth, and then in these two different, let's say, subject justifications of these kinds of um, um, objective objective phenomena, um, but but so that would not solve the problem if we were all um, um, all if we all had the right to work, and I think Hegel's argument is quite strong because as long as we conceive of the right to work in the way in which civil society tells us that we should conceive of the right to work. There is necessarily, I think this is Hegel's, Hegel's point, this kind of contradiction lurking in the back, right? I mean, so we we can have these fantasies of that, that Luhmann attributes to Hegel, which I think he doesn't have, uh, right? Of all inclusion into the, that would be an all inclusion, inclusion argument into the, 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 the sphere of, um, of into, the, into the sphere of the economy and even, let's say, a, we would form a what what Hegel in a handwritten note at one point um, within within with an expression that then afterwards became famous because it, people believe it was coined by Hannah Arendt a Recht auf Rechte right so Hegel says well if we could demand that kind of uh, if we could demand a right to realize our own freedom that would be uh, like demanding the right to be loved. So as if I could demand someone that he or she loves me, and that would be that kind of anspruch would be totally empty as well. It's not, and and so this kind of, if you if you if you if you if you inscribe a kind of meta right to have the right to realize your own freedom through gaining your own subsistence, that doesn't solve a problem. This is, I think, the strictness of Hegel's of Hegel's Hegel's position. So he's basically saying that the entirety of what he is describing in the philosophy of rights. And I think therefore, I mean, this is the argument that I'm trying to make also in the article, that therefore it is not a surprise that he uses the famous all of the Minerva image, right? Which only begins its flight with the with the dawning at dusk. 
at the in the preface to the to the uh, philosophy of right that the entirety of what he is describing there is not a normative template for a functioning state but something that i mean that somehow produces contradictions that these institutions are not apt to to resolve Thank you. Thank you very much for your reaction. Uh, Manu, you'd like to ask a question? Um, yes. Um, so um, thank, um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I also would like to ask something about the, the paper that you wrote for us. And um, I think it was, I think it is very interesting. Um, what, what you wrote about the decline of the state. Um, um, you, you quote um, um, a famous, um, um, the famous preface from, from the philosophy of right, um, 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 when the, the philosophy paints the gray, a shape of life has grown old and it cannot be, uh, rejuvenated, uh, but only recognize it by the gray in gray of philosophy. Um, I um, I was thought that um, um, Mark, Marx um, um, has something um, interesting in, in his um, manuscript uh, from the capital. Um, he says that um, um, that um, his um, I quote um, in German um, that his um, um, begriff um, um, capital begriff um, 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 is not a, a, a incarnation of the uh, incarnation einer ewigen Idee. Uh, das Kapital is not. Um, um, it's not a um, incarnation and an ewigen idee. Um, and uh, um, I was thinking that um, um, for um, Hegel could not um, imagine um, um, the end of um, of the state. Um, but Hegel, um, in his um, in his um, lecture um, on the philosophy of history, um, he sees uh, he sees um, that the the national state can disappear, not his um, idea of ethical state, but the national state. Um, and so my question, um, do you think um, this is a, a failure in the, the Hegel system? Um, should Hegel imagine the decline of his own idea of state? Well, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very tricky, um, that's a very tricky, um, tricky question. Um, well, I'd say um, I'd say somehow. Well, the argument I tried to make today is that even though one seems to make a step, a hat, and advance in moving from Hegel to Marx. That's the classical rendering, right? I mean, Hegel's still idealist and Marx more materialist. Hegel's still kind of semi-medieval economy and then adequate understanding of economy and so forth. But I think with 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 the things that were that one is encountering today, there is this paradoxical, I think, um, or maybe not paradoxical, but 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 there is a situation where on the one hand side. A lot of um, um, maybe Marxist theory is one of the best we have to understand the workings of economy. Yet phenomena that we're encountering everywhere almost um, seem to be more adequately described with less. Let me put it like that: um, um, optimistic or sub-optimistic or um, revolutionary impetus. So I'm not. What, what I'm trying to say, uh, or what I was trying to say, and why I why I, I wanted to rephrase it in terms of Luhmann's exclusion and stuff like that, right? Because 
um, I mean, to, to, to cut a long story very short, is maybe Luhmann has a point, and there is actually a lot of exclu cumulative exclusionary processes happening, but that does not lead to what the, a standard version of Marxism um, anticipated, namely a formation of revolutionary groups and consciousnesses and so forth, but rather something like a generalized form of indignation, right, about the injustices that are produced, about the in, in, in exclusionary mechanism. So rather something that comes much closer to what Hegel describes as the pueblo or the rebel, right? Um, now, what does that mean for the, 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 um, the status of Hegel's idea of the state. And I mean, in some sense, of course, um, depending, and this is th this is why this is a, a complicated, I think, um, um, and, and very interesting and important discussion. Um, so if Hegel says in the, in the outlines that the idea of right is the being there, the Dasein of the idea of freedom, and this idea constitutively, if it is there, so if it has a Dasein, so if it, 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 it is not simply an idea, but it appears, let me put it like that, right? it necessarily unfolds in, to a form um, which reaches its, let's say, highest form of development in the state, then if, if, if that thesis can still be upheld, and I think it kind of can. I, I must. I must admit. Um, 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 then, then the question is, what? So let me let me let me start again. To so what I what I want to say now is, on the one hand side, let's say maybe um, historically we made a step back from the situation Marx was thinking into a situation Hegel was thinking. And what does that mean for Hegel's conceptualization? Of the state. On the one hand side, it's important that what Hegel depicts in the outlines is not a normative theory. On the other hand side, you're fundamentally right that he, and this is what he shows in the philosophy of history, all historical existence, all historical transformation begins when, this, uh, when, the, when the very idea of the state um, and thereby the idea of fri uh, uh, freedom um, 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 uh, manifests in such a way that history proper can be, can be, can be depicted. And the latter argument, I mean, just look at the history of the 20th century, right? Seems to be, I mean, all, let's say, fundamentally transformative attempts or all attempts um, of um, that 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 um, um, aimed at um, collective emancipation and collective liberation and a collective organization of um, equality were ultimately. And necessarily, it seems so, mediated, manifest in one or the other form of the state. Right. So what I what I would like to say, and what 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 um, I would like to say is that I think Hegel has a very strong point that there is history when there is state history. I think that is a a, a claim that. In, in 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 some sense means it's a kind of register. Of historical development, it's a kind of medium of, of of history that doesn't hold for for all spheres of human practices. Obviously not, right? I mean, there can be stuff that is not state art, for example, right? That is clear. But, but, but nonetheless, I mean, this this seems to be crucial for me. Does that mean we need to read the outlines of the philosophy of right as normative state theory? No, not at all. I think it's totally dated, and Hegel indicates that absolutely that this state that he depicts is not the state of all states, right? So where does that leave us? On the one hand side, with the idea that one might conceive of a state, and right now I'm approaching uh, something like Marx again, which is freed or liberated maybe from all the contradiction that Hegel depicts in the out, uh, outlines of the philosophy of right, right, in this type of realization of the very Dasein of freedom. On the other hand side, um, without giving up, the very idea of that type of collective organization, which is, to cut a long story short, more than just like an economic working together, so more than just oikos. Is that an answer?
Um, yes, thank you. Um, um, I was um, just thinking um, in, in this point um, that um, um, we could say that um, both um, Marx's uh, concept of capital and the, the Hegelian idea of state, um, if, you, if we see in the um, inside of the Hegel systems, uh, uh, the concept of capital and the idea of state belongs um, to the um, sphere of finite relations in the mm -hmm. um, objective spirit. I mean, that um, it means that both um, capital and also the idea of state should uh, one time come to, well, I mean, to an end. Just, just to add very quickly, I um, mean, if you read the end of the outline of the philosophy of history, I mean, the thing really ends, right? I mean, that, that's the, I mean, so the, um, at the end of the outlines, we get the transition into I mean, through mediated through through Hegel's theory of war into the philosophy of history, right? So, so there that 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 is that means that the very idea. I mean, he doesn't eternalize the state. I, I I think he doesn't do it. But he basically this is what I what I meant when I when I was trying to emphasize that it is kind of the medium of collective historical existence, right, in which it manifests. But that doesn't mean simply that one state will hold will reproduce itself and maintain itself forever even though maybe there is no state which could integrate into its own structure and understanding this kind of constitutive form of finitude right but what what i think what is important for hegel's if we want to put it like that let's say normative imbuement of the idea of the state the i mean hegel calls the state gang gottes in der welt right mistranslated i think as march of god in the world mistranslated why because i think hegel's point is if god gate so if god goes he's gone right i mean god is gone and what do we get if god is gone we get the state that's the whole i mean that's the point right so um we say goodbye to god because god is is disappears in the world and then the whole question is what do we do with the state that has become a kind of worldly god um well i mean precisely what we have to do when 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 god becomes worldly and we realize that everything that god is is nothing but the community of those who believe in god right i mean th this is what what i what i what i was emphasizing so and if i was trying to emphasize in a, in a, in a rather bad way but but what that means is that the state is not simply only finite right but it's it's the inscription of the infinity of a collective free will that wills the free will, so it's infinite, right? The free will that wills the free will into a finite, finite form, into a finite collective body. I would say. I mean, th this is that, um, and so, and I think this is an implication of the concept of the state. The manifestation that Hegel depicts in the outlines is one particular manifestation with which comes with problems, but that does not per se refute the idea of this concept of the state. Right? And this concept of the state is, let's say, the way in which 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 his, history actually happens. I think, and and I think if I mean, to to me, this sounds quite defensible. Actually, I have to say. Because then maybe, I mean, this is why I emphasized it in that way, because maybe um, if the state is an inscription of a collective free will willing to collectively will the free will, um, maybe that sometimes doesn't even look like a state anymore. That I mean, right? It, it could look in, in a way that is very fundamentally different from what we immediately would uh, believe um, a state must look like. If that were the normative content that we, normative normative um, implication that we would uh, be able to filter out. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the answer. So uh, let me, also raise a question and um, 
first, I would like to thank you very much, um, Professor Huda. Uh, I think that your uh, lecture um, wonderfully met the aims of our uh, webinar series. Uh, we could um, we could uh, perceive a really um, hard work on um, diagonizing uh, our our present time and our political moment. And uh, my question uh, will try to dialogue with I think that this um, this point of your presentation. So um, when we have as you expose it, this situation with a uh, widespread indignation among society because of this uh, cumulative inequality, uh, what are the possible political outcomes? You uh, presented one, the uh, grotesque, uh, grotesque sovereignty. That is one of the possible outcomes. Are there more possible political outcomes? How to deal with this sentiment, this sentiment of uh, uh, de, de, um, of the illegitimacy of the uh, whole civil society, whole modern civil society? Um, the unique outcome would be um, grotesque sovereignty, uh, is there another um, um, outcome that maybe is also hinted in your article uh, that is anarchist, uh, anarchism? Uh, uh, maybe is there a, 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 like a socialist outcome also? And mm -hmm. with with this question, uh, I would like to make uh, a bridge. Uh, I would like to bridge this question with a second one. Uh, mm -hmm. You, uh, in your your book, uh, Hegel's Rebel, um, make um, a, a, um, make a, a certain uh, criticism against Axel Honneth, and you. Um, criticizes more specifically the way that he um, deals with the, the rebel and the indignation. Um, and your your object, let, let me say like that, is, is the book um, uh, uh, Pathologies of Individual Freedom. Mm -hmm. But he, in this book, actually, the, the concept of indignation isn't um, used by Honneth. I think that this concept becomes more uh, important in his work later on, in Freedom's Right uh, and in the idea of socialism. I think that uh, Honneth tries to um, suggest that socialism in his very specific way of conceiving socialists would be also a political outcome for uh, a moment characterized by a widespread indignation among society. So I would I would, uh, would lovely uh, to hear you uh, to to hear you talk a little bit about these issues. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, thank you, Ricardo. Um, um, also, very very difficult things. Uh, but let me let me start with the first one. Um, so you're right. Yes, what I suggested is in a situation in which there is widespread indignation. And just I don't know. Think about there was even the movement of the indignados, and right. I mean, it's just like almost. I mean, it's almost a Hegelian 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 moment. Um, um, one possible option, and that is potentially the worst option, um, is 
to make the move um, to take a stance with regard not simply to civil society, but also with regard to the state in such a way that everything the state was supposed to generate uh, in, in, in Hegel's sense, um, in terms of Sittlichkeit, ethicality, right? I mean, so, um, and a form of, well, I mean, it's almost dangerous to say that, but um, especially for a German, actually, but um, a patriotic attitude, um, right? I mean, this is what well, how Hegel describes how uh, the ethical regime or the the ethicality the ethical substance zitlich substance manifests or is is subjectivized right i mean that that's crucial it, it's is subjectivized as a patri patriotic attitude right um namely as the identification or as the identity of um of me knowing that in all my practices in which I do not seem to realize only my own freedom, but also that of the others, I realized in the best possible way my own freedom. Right. So working with others, to cut a long story short, right, in this form of collective organization is the best way. So one way of how to deal with the widespread indignation is basically to say, well, that is all not true. And the only, right, I mean, ethicality is not true. Sittlichkeit is a problematic idea. And what that leads to, I think, and that is just, I mean, that's just an attempt to, with Hegelian, Foucauldian means to describe a historical phase, if you wish, or situation, it leads, and it can be described and, and, and conceptualized uh, uh, by means of what Hegel uh, has to offer, it means to cut off the very, to suspend, to bracket um, the very idea that there could be something like a form of collective freedom and that it is all about let's say individual freedom realizations right or in and and so it is more atomistic to put it like that and this type of atomization atomization and even though I think that that is not yet enough to describe what makes the lumpen proletariat the lumpen proletariat, but because there must also be a general sense, let's say, if you see that there is poverty um, spreading, and there is this, I think, quite quite nice term that the the French um, theorist, uh, psych psychoanalytic theorist, and linguist Jean Claude Milner. Once, um, once um, invented a couple of years ago, namely that of the salarite bourgeoisie, lone bourgeoisie, and the the very idea is that even the privileges that have been um, that 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 that, that um, could have been seen just like um, a while ago as being uh, hereditary or uh, right um, um, through the generations for let's say the upper echelons of the bourgeoisie, even those were put into question by stuff like the financial crisis and so forth, right? Even those, the people who seem to be more or less well off, um, like 20, maybe 50 years ago, whatsoever, even those are starting to be scared sometimes of the instability and of the uh, structural deadlocks. And even their indignation is felt. What happens in in, 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 in situation like that is that let's say the precondition for a rich rebel is generated. People want, want to be rich and they don't want to go through what they believe is not trustworthy anymore. And this is, this is what I see in, 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 in Foucault's, Foucault's depiction and Marx's depiction of, of what the grotesque sovereign is um, manifesting. Um, now, in this sense, Hegel helps to analyze what Marx calls a symptom of decay, I think, right? This is this is what I was trying to to point to, and Hegel's um, and Hegel's characterization as the poor rebel being fueled and driven by indignation is interesting because the indignation is almost, let's say, 
directless. It doesn't have an address C, right? It, and there, this is why why I mentioned this one Luhmann quote, right? I mean, this what he basically says. Well, this is wrong with the Marxists. They always believe there is a culprit, but in in in, in hyper differentiated societies, there is no address C. There is not. It's not all Bill Gates or whatever, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's not even all Trump, right? I mean, there there is no that one one culprit. And I think that Luhmann has a point there, right? And because th this is what makes people even more indignated that they, right? I mean, they don't even know what, why the hell this, this is happening and who, 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 and this is a very dangerous situation, I think, structurally. Um, 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 uh, who, 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 whose fault their, their situation is. So, so as I said, in this sense, I think, um, 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 Hegel can help to understand the genesis the constitution, the popular basis, and its structural structural prerequisites of the formation of a uh, symptom of decay that I, I named with Foucault grotesque sovereign and that you can see from, I don't know, Orban to Trump to, well, you have some of them too. And um, um, what to do about this? Um, the, on the one hand side, I think, um, um, Hegel is brutally realistic. Indignation as such, right, does not generate anything, right? It is a delegitimization, a de-justification of the system in which there's indignation. As the early Marx says, right, I mean, indignation is always indignation about the existence of indignation. So the people who feel indignation are mainly uh, indignated about that they need to be angry at the system that treats them the way that 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 they feel treated. Um, that is not a very satisfying answer, obviously, right? Um, 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 on the one hand side, I think it is a very realist answer because I I, and this is why I emphasize so much when when Emmanuel uh, uh, raised the question that I don't necessarily see the philosophy of right. Um, just like offering normative potentials of right, I mean, what an ideal should, uh, state should look like and wh what's happening. I mean, I think Hegel is far more realistic. He's basically saying, well, we're all potentially and latently in this poor rebel position, right? We're all indi potentially indignated like, by a st structural, structural contradiction that uh, emerge everywhere and so forth. The thing I think that one um, um, could learn, and this is what I wanted to, well, I wouldn't say add, but, 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 but bring to the table through the uh, grotesque sovereignty concept is that the, that the strong thesis that Foucault formulates is Grotesque sovereigns emerge, so populist leaders, whatever, right? I mean, you you get you get the concept. They 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 emerge. They originate when there is a widespread widespread de-justification of a system to cope with this de-justification tendency to cope with indignation without coping with it. Right. So it's an attempt to solve the problem without solving the problem. Right? Why? Because then all people look at Trump's Twitter feed and get angry what what how horrible he is, and they hope that if there is no Trump, it will just return all to normal. Right? And thereby, if you if that belief is instilled, you can hardly explain why there was Trump in the first place. Right? You fantasize a normality that never existed before Trump. Right? And you act as if the financial crisis never happened and uh, everything. So, I mean, there was American social democracy and it dealt with it in the, in the best possible manner. You, you see my point. I mean, so, so in this sense, I think one should learn, one can learn from this that, that the two paths are two different forms of not solving the problem. And the one is realistic. Right, that is the poor rebel. We don't have the solution yet. And in this sense, I think Hegel is absolutely and radically non-normatively open to historical developments. Right? One can easily say, well, one needs a new theory of organization forming there, which takes into account, I don't know, historical experiences and all the things that didn't work and so forth. I mean, I'm totally open for these kinds of things. But I think Hegel, for example, offers the precondition for totally being open on that side. On the other hand side, you have a form of non separation which acts as if it actually solves the problem, which it doesn't, right? So, so I think this is, this is where we stand from this perspective with, with Hegel. And um, if that is a, 
if that is what I think Hegel can do, I think this is this is pretty much the situation we're in actually. As as I mean, that is very generally uh, uh, spoken. Um, and uh, with regard to the second question, much more briefly, I promise. Um, well, I have nothing against Axelon there, right? I mean, just to get that out of the way, of course not. My my critique in the Rebel book is basically that um, <clears throat> he, in that book, which is a reading of the philosophy, right? He reads pathologies as problematic individual stances towards elements of the overall ethical framework uh, of which these individuals are a part. Right. They can, for example, just understand themselves as an abstract uh, abstract person of rights, and then they act merely negatively and don't want to be infringed upon or whatever. Um, or, or they can understand themselves merely as a moral person, and um, right, then, 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 then they they bracket, let's say, the the in interferences. Um, uh, the, sorry, the interferential, let's say, networks and productive loops between abstract, uh, between abstract right morality and and ethicality and the different dimensions. Um, and the only argument I wanted to make was, well, that is totally true for the sphere of abstract right, and these kinds of pathologies emerge, and this is totally true for the for the sphere of morality where these kinds of uh, pathologies emerge. But that's totally not true for poverty. Because that is not an individual pathology. It's just like a structural one. That is what we have been talking about earlier, right? I mean, it's a contradiction that cannot not be produced by civil society. And if that is the case, right, we have something, I mean, that if I recall correctly, I, in the Rebel book, I call pathology of the social. So it's not simply a pathology, right, which, 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 which results from a misunderstanding of an individual with regard to its own place or with, which is limited, but which, which, which springs or which originates in a structural, structural contradiction, right? So, so, and sometimes, and this is what I take Hegel to suggest. This is why I don't read Hegel normatively, because I think he suggests that civil society as such is a contradictory concept, which, which man and the, the contradiction uh, uh, manifests as a type of pathology, which then if the poor rebel um, is indignated about that kind of pathology, cannot be, even though Hegel suggests that himself, cannot be a kind of a pathology of the same type. Right? So a misunderstanding of my role in a in a larger larger um, um, a framework. Um, I'm I think I'm not totally competent enough to say a lot about the idea of socialism. Well, um, I I my my leanings are very minimal into the uh, anarchist side. I have to say I'm I'm a fan of um, uh, new forms uh, of organization and and the like. And I think then the then the discuss, uh, discussion. So I'm I'm I'm. I think then the discussion gets at from one point onwards becomes really complicated. Let me say one more thing. So you know that in the 18th Brumaire, um, all the coup and so forth, all that slowly uh, points in the direction of the Paris Commune, right? Uh, which Marx calls the finally found political form, which he thinks that is ultimately the form in which workers' self-emancipation and liberation can be organized and equality and so forth. That pr pr generated problems that Marx and um, the, the communards did not foresee, namely that it was not sustainable and it was crashed right by, by um, the, the, the French military. And this then instilled in someone like Lenin the belief that if one solves the problem, how to make the Paris Commune sustainable, one has solved the problem of emancipation. And this is why he founded the Revolutionary Party of Russia, right? I mean, that that, that the party was supposed to do that. Um, well, that generated problems of its own that even led um, um, to the de de developments in China, right? And and even Mao was, was, I think, at one point quite aware of that. And then Cultural Revolution. And this is also a problem which is kind of unsolved. What is the finally found, is there a finally found political form in which to organize emancipation? It must be a form. I mean, I'm, I'm, 
um, in this sense, an absolute uh, Hegelian uh, to the core. Um, it should be whatever that means. Um, I mean, uh, Formasi was finally found Hegel in the logic of the absolute form. What what does that mean concretely now? I think that is a very complicated complicated discussion. I I don't yet have a great answer. I I have to disappoint you, but I mean, but we know a lot of things that it can't be right now. I think. Thank you very much. Really, thank you for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, to take advantage of the fact that we uh, we don't have questions from the chat, so I would like to uh, to ask one more question, uh, and then uh, regarding the time frame limitation we have, uh, we're supposed to go uh, until five p.m. Uh, I will suggest that we head towards the end of the seminar. So. Uh, uh, Actually, it's a, a remark, and uh, I wanted to say that actually I have a problem with these understandings of yours about the rich rebel as a gambler and uh, who uh, doesn't want to work uh, but try to make a living and living in luxus, playing with stocks, betting, speculating. Uh, and I have a problem with that because I think nowadays uh, we have. Uh, many intellectuals, uh, and um, I have particularly in mind Axel Honneth or Thomas Piketty, and uh, so intellectuals who uh, are also these initiatives, I don't know if you're familiar with, but I, I guess uh, yes, uh, these initiatives like democratizing work, it's this manifest who was launched at the beginning of the pandemics. So uh, there are many um, initiatives, intellectuals, who seems to defend that the problem is not capitalism itself, but uh, a specific development of capitalism, uh, which they mm -hmm. seem to, to defend that it's an arbitrary development mm -hmm. of capitalism. So neoliberalism, uh, capitalism, where speculation and finances are very strong, and where uh, the uh, investment in industry decreases, where morality or ethicity are not considered uh, or are not taken into account. So I'd like to know your point of view uh, about this position for which the problem is not capitalism, but neoliberalism, finance capitalism, and mm. uh, that we can reform capitalism. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I, I don't think that finance is the problem and I, I i well i see if you render it like that i see that i that one may be able to read what i'm saying as a defense of a i don't know moderate what people call sometimes capitalism with a human face or whatever right or non in Germany, there was this. I, I, I again forgot who invented this absolutely horrible term. Um, it was basically, uh, um, 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 I think it was a social democrat, but I, but I, but it escapes me who that was. Um, and the, the argument was against the Raubtier capitalism, so against the wild capitalism, right? Where, where, where we were basically all predators, right? I mean, so a little bit more humane and so forth. And, and and just to be absolutely clear, I think that already Hegel, this is I think that the entire point shows that this is a fantasy. I mean that that's the I, I think this is why I emphasize so much that the, the production of contradictions in civil society, and this ha this means a lot for what we're talking about when we're talking about something else, um, 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 are necessary, right? So civil society in its realization cannot but. This is what Hegel is saying, and I'm I'm not making that up. I mean, just reads right um, um, the the um, what he says about civil society cannot but produce contradictions. Let me translate that in more modern languages. The problems with capitalism won't go away. This is what that means. What does that mean? Well, we should be able to talk about um, what. I think Marx pointed out a number of times, but what one can can very very um, clearly see in the way in which Hegel constructs the argument in the outlines of the philosophy of right. Um, so the outlines of the philosophy of right um, depict to us 
what we get when the what he calls the Erscheinungswelt des Sittlichen, so the world of appearance of the ethical, right? I think that is one translation, is civil society, right? I mean that so how does the state, how does the state appear? How does the ethical sphere appear? It appears as civil society. What is civil society? It's the market, right? So that is and why why is that? Because the the entire outlines uh, of the philosophy of right depict the unfolding and the realization and the becoming more and more concrete of the concept of freedom. Right. Now, when there are arguments that people have made that um, it is, this is an argument you find in Marx, that the moment you are you commit yourself to these two claims, that the world of appearance of the ethical, so of what is the ethical substance of a of a uh, community, and this is taken to be nothing but the realization of individual freedoms. Um, um, if you commit yourself to that kind of thing, you're defending capitalism no matter what, right? I mean, Marx basically shows this shapes the idea of freedom in such a way that you get um, <clears throat> um, freedom, equality, and Bentham, right? I mean, that is that is the famous famous formula. Um, the Immediate and very, I mean, to cut a long story short, one, one possible suggestion is, wouldn't that look quite different if we would try to establish, and I think uh, Hegel has um, resources for that, because he clearly indicates several times in the outlines that the state has absolute conceptual primacy over civil society, so that's important, right? So the state is primary and um, not... Um, not um, um, civil society, even though the, the order of presentation is different. What if there is no primacy of freedom over equality or a deriving from of the very concept of equality through the realization of freedom, but just the other way around, right? So an insistence, let me put it like that, of an absolute primacy of politics over economy, which, I mean, which is how some people how some people have tried to interpret uh, Hegel's outlines, um, and an absolute insistence. That doesn't mean an infringement of freedoms. I mean, this is what liberals immediately scream, but I mean, this is what I think is, is it, that's not a real, real discussion, but that means something else. What if it's the realization of the idea of equality, which does not at all exclude freedom, but, right, I mean, the primacy, primacy is a different one, because I think then certain things that Hegel shows and demonstrates um, um, the contradictions that the primacy of freedom over equality um, generate may not appear in the same way. And in this sense, well, I don't think it can be reformed, no, but it can be changed, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your reply and uh, for the reaction uh, to the, uh, the questions we had. Uh, we would like to, uh, uh, in behalf of the organizing committee, uh, to thank you for joining us here today and uh, to thank uh, the, uh, the attendees who uh, are watching us. Uh, I'd like to thank my, my colleagues of the organizing committee. I will uh, hand over to them so uh, if they want you to say uh, goodbye. I'd like to remind everyone that soon this video will be available in our YouTube channel. I think it's immediately, right, with StreamYard. And uh, we are, uh, we will soon add Portuguese subtitles to it. Uh, also, don't forget to check out our uh, internet page uh, of the Hegelian Journal with information about the next seminars. Uh, yeah, I hope to see you next time. Thank you once again to uh, uh, Professor Huda. If you want to say uh, something, uh, I can hand over to you. And uh, I also hand over to Ricardo and Manu. Um, I just want to thank you, Frank, uh, for the presentation and Ricardo for the um, um, for all the things um, with um, extreme art of the organization <laughs> and and also thank you for uh, for the people that are seeing us on 
on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much for having me. This was very pleasant. Yeah. I, I just want to express that uh, for me, it was also really a great pleasure and a great honor to receive you here this time um, online in this improvised way to keep discussing, discussing um, with uh, people abroad, but we really uh, still, wa still want to realize our initial original plan, that is to receive you here in Brazil uh, to talk uh, further and uh, to introduce you <laughs> a little bit uh, to our institutions and uh, to, to our philosophical community, let's say like that. Uh, it will be also a, a even greater pleasure. So um, that, that, that's it. So we have a plan. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Thank you all. I, 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 I would like only to stress that um, the the record the, the uh, of the video uh, it will be. Um, always uh, avail available in our um, YouTube channel, in the online Hegel journal uh, or um, uh, uh, Revista de Estudos uh, Hegelianos um, for all one, uh, for everyone that is interested on our uh, web seminar series. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.